A Sure Foundation, written by Pastor James Knox. Chapter number four, The Unchangeable God. In this lesson, we want to take up the fact that God is eternal and unchangeable. While God works according to the laws of time in the sense that it takes time for him to work out his plan, there is no danger that lack of time will hinder him, for he has an eternity in which to work. The greatest men have seemed to abandon their most cherished plans because their own powers begin to decay. But God never grows old. The Lord is never tired. Jehovah never sleeps. His purposes are everlasting purposes, and he has an eternity in which to work them out. For this very reason, we may fail to understand his plans, since all we see in an entire lifetime is a tiny glimpse of the whole working of God in his creation. We may fail to see his movements. Let us consider these matters of God being eternal and God being unchangeable. Number one, God is eternal. The Bible says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. The scripture says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1, 1. You may say, what part of heaven did God come from? Oh, no, no, no. Heaven came from God. People say, where on earth did God come from? No, 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 earth came from God. People worship trees and rocks, or they take stones and tree trunks and carve them into images, and then they worship these images. Oh, my friends, can you see how these people are cheating and deceiving and shortchanging themselves? God is not an image of something in his creation. God is not a part of nature. God is not a man or like a man or an invention of man, for all those things came from God. God is the everlasting, from everlasting to everlasting. The Bible says, Thou art God. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains, before the earth, before the world, God was. And what he was, he is. One day Moses asked God, When the people ask what your name is, what shall I tell them? And God replied, I am that I am, Exodus 3.14. You see, God is eternal. In the New Testament, we have it written this way. Now on to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 1.17. Our God is, though he remains invisible. He is the only wise God because there is no other God. To the one true God belongs all the honor and all the glory. Forever and ever, all glory and honor will go to this one God. For the Bible says God is the King eternal. I do not know what part of the world you live in, but in your area there have been kings. At some time or another, a king has ruled over part of your world. There may be a king there now. There may have been a king who lived and has passed away. But you know the man that is reigning now is not the king who was reigning two or three centuries ago. He is not the king who was reigning 2,000 years ago. He is not the king who was reigning there 100 years ago. Because those kings were men, they died. Their reign and their mortal existence came to an end. This is not true of God. God was king before the earth. He was king before the world. He was king before the mountains were brought forth. When all heaven and earth have passed away, God will still be king. He is the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Number two, God is self-existent. We get our life originally from God. There is the union of man and a woman, but it is God who causes life to begin within the womb of a woman. There could be no formation of any living thing without God. Psalm 139 verse 13 says, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Notice there was a me before there was a birth, and God causes that life to begin. 
In the womb, by the miraculous working of God, the baby is being formed and developed. After it is born, it gains life and strength from the God who gave it breath. We are not self-existent, but God is. God did not get life from you. He does not stay alive by something you provide for him. It is just the other way around. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. John chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. God has life in himself. You get life from God. Physical life or spiritual life, either one is received as a gift from God. God receives his life from no one. He has life in himself. Number three, God not only has life in himself, but he gives life to whomsoever he wills. He even gives eternal life to those who will believe on his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, as God manifest in the flesh, hath this power to give life. In John chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Again in John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. What image of stone, what church, what religion, what man, what idol has life in itself? Not a one. And my friend, what image, what idol, what church, what man, what religion can give you eternal, everlasting life? I say there is not a one, but God in heaven, manifest in the flesh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the true and living God. He is the one who has life in himself. He is the one who is eternal life. He is the one who can and will give you eternal life if you will trust him as your personal savior. Number four, God is unchangeable, both in essence, that is what he is, and in character, that is what he does. The Bible illustrates this in several places. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1, verse 17. Men are varied, their opinions vary. They come in various shapes and forms. There are many variations of a certain theme of music. If something varies, it differs, it changes. It is not the same all the way through. It is not the same in the end as it was in the beginning. But the Bible says that with the Father is no variableness. He does not change. In the last book of our Old Testament, God says this, just as simply and understandably as you could ever want it. For I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. People say, I can't understand the Bible. Oh, but there is no problem in understanding the Bible. God has written his book so simply that anyone can get it. The God of heaven, the creator of this universe, the one true and living God, does not change. Did God hate sin once upon a time? Then he does today. Has he ever punished sin? Yes, he has. Then he does today. Will God keep his word? Will God forgive sin? Will God save and deliver all those that call upon him and trust in him? He has, and therefore he shall. He does not change. He has never changed. He never will change. This is the true God. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep, Psalm 121, verse 4. He is unchangeable. He is eternal. He never grows old. He never gets tired. 
The Bible says in Isaiah 40 that God is not like man. Men get tired, men get weary, nations crumble, fall, decay into the dust. But God is eternal, unchanging, everlasting. His strength, power, might, wisdom, glory, beauty, majesty, love, mercy, and grace are just as full, complete, strong, and powerful, and available today as they ever have been or ever shall be. This is the God of the Bible. Number five. He is in no sense subject to the limitations of time as we know it. For example, Psalm 90 verses 1 to 4 says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. To God a thousand years are what? Well, they are just as a day. That is what the wording seems to imply. Let us look to the book of Second Peter to see if that implication is correct. I heard a man say this very morning that there are three things about Second Peter that ungodly men despise. Those three things are chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. I happen to love the book, as I do all 66 books of the authorized King James Bible. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. To us a day seems like it is flying by, gone in a moment. A thousand years to our finite human mind seems like a longer period of time than we can even grasp in our wildest thoughts and dreams. We cannot comprehend a thousand years. But to God, there is no difference between the two time periods. What you and I think about a thousand years and what we think about a second are vastly different. But suppose you were eternal. Suppose that from everlasting to everlasting, you had always been and that you always would be exactly what you are. Suppose you would never change and your strength would never fail you. What if you would never grow tired, never grow old, never gr get weary, never get weak or fail in your powers and your abilities? What would be the difference between one hour and one million years? You see, when Jesus Christ invites you to come to him and receive everlasting life, or warns you that if you reject him, you will spend eternity in a lake of fire and brimstone, burning in conscious torment. It is hard for us to grasp the importance of that, because we think in terms of days, weeks, months, and even years. But an eternal God who says that in his estimation, 1,000 years is no different than a single day, is not to be ignored. God is telling you that while thousands and thousands and thousands of years go by, you can be either enjoying the glory of heaven he has prepared or suffering the torment of the hell that he has prepared. God invites you to trust his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might have everlasting life rather than suffering everlasting torment and punishment. Dear friend, that proves God loves you. For he warns you and pleads with you to be saved. He and he alone understands the incredible magnitude of eternity. Only God comprehends everlasting existence. And he calls for you to choose everlasting life that you might escape everlasting punishment. To summarize then, God, number one, is eternal. Number two, is self-existent. Number three, not only has life in himself, but gives eternal life to whosoever will receive him. Number four, he is unchangeable, both in essence and in character. Number five, is in no sense subject to the limitations of time as we know it. A thousand years unto him are as one day. Living as we do in the land of decay, we see things growing old. Buildings, machinery, and materials are in constant need of repair. We watch the plants weaken and wither and die. It is exceedingly hard for us to grasp the concept of an eternal, unchangeable God. Yet there is no other God that can rightly demand our worship. 
If you made something out of wood or stone and called that a god and sought to worship it, you must know that in time that idol would waste away to nothing. Suppose you exalted a man such as Muhammad or Buddha or some pope, priest or preacher, and chose to follow him. You know he's going to grow old and die, or has already died. In many parts of the world, the dead departed ancestor is worshipped. My friend, if they were worthy of worship, they would not have died, and they would not be departed. No matter how hard you try to convince yourself that a departed ancestor sits in a great chair in your living room, if you go over and sit in that chair, no one will resist you. There is no one there. Only our God is eternal. He is everlasting. He is the King. In God's dealings with men, he has sought to reveal himself by every possible means. The trouble has been that we are so dull in learning. The problem is not with God's revelation of himself. The problem is with our ability or willingness to receive his revelation. The very fact that we stay here on earth for such a short time has made it necessary for God to deal with every separate generation anew. He continues calling out to men despite all the thousands and tens of thousands and millions and billions of people who have said no to Jesus Christ. Though countless multitudes have turned away from his forgiveness, love, and mercy, and marched straight into the torments of hell, God continues to tell sinners Christ died for their sins. Jesus paid your penalty on the cross. Three nights and three days later, he did what no religious leader has ever done. He walked out of the tomb under his own power. He is alive forevermore. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of his Father. He is ready, willing, and able to cleanse you from all your sin, to forgive all your transgressions, and to give you everlasting life. If you will but believe upon him and trust him, he will save your soul. The self-existence of God is the only explanation for the origin of life. It is no accident that you are here. You did not evolve from some monkey. It is no chance, no quirk of fate, that you are learning about the eternal God. Man can neither give life nor can he prolong it. God is the giver of all life. It is his right alone to take life. It is his right alone to give life. You do not know the moment when you will breathe your last breath. You do not know the moment when your physical, mortal life will end. Let me ask you a most important question. If today the God who gave you physical life were to take that physical life from you, what could you do about it? Absolutely nothing. All right. If that were to take place today, where would you go? There are only two destinations, heaven and hell. How do you get to hell? By doing absolutely nothing. Simply by living and dying in your sins, you arrive in the fires of hell. How do you get to heaven? You come to the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge that you are a sinner. Pray to him just as simply and honestly and sincerely as you can from the depths of your heart. God, I believe that you are my creator. I believe that you are the one who gave me my life. I believe that you will give me everlasting life as soon as my sins are forgiven. I believe, Lord God, that you were manifest in the flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus laid down his life to pay for my sins and that he rose from the dead. I trust him. I do not trust myself. I do not trust any man. I do not trust any religion. I do not trust any idol. God, I trust Jesus Christ. I trust him as my Savior. I receive him by faith, everlasting life from him. Do you believe that in your heart? Then trust God and believe the Lord to do what he said he would do. My friend, that is the way of salvation. You cannot save yourself. God gives life. You must receive the gift of life from the God that loves you, the God that cares for you, the God that made you, and the God who desires that you spend eternity with him.